Good afternoon. It is 1225 on Wednesday, the 20th of July. This is the very, very last video for the class and it is on reconstruction and it's going to be very quick. I just want to do a short little concept overview and share a little bit of the information on reconstruction. One of the things I want to stress and emphasize is that there were really only two plans on what to do after the Civil War. Abraham Lincoln is in the left column, Congress and the Senate is in the right column. Left column was called the Proclamation of Amnesty and Reconstruction, better known as Lincoln's 10% plan. On the right is a plan promoted by Senator Benjamin Wade and Representative Henry Davis. It was the 50% plan. So why is one a 10% plan, one a 50% plan? Well, in Lincoln's plan, 10% of the Southern people who voted for president in 1860 had to pledge allegiance to the United States. In the Wade Davis bill, that number bumped up to 50%. That's the biggest difference there. Lincoln's plan was overall a slap on the wrist, a little wag of the finger saying, don't do that again. Wade Davis bill, a little bit more harsh. A secondary part of the Wade Davis bill, and this is really what made it harsh, was that there was an ironclad oath. You had to swear that you never supported the Confederacy in any way, shape, or form. Notice though, neither plan would have allowed Confederate officials back into the government neither plan would have allowed African Americans to vote. What ends up happening is Lincoln proposes his plan to the Senate and to Congress. They say absolutely not and refuse to take it up and turn it into a bill. When the Wade Davis bill is passed, it goes to President Lincoln for his signature and President Lincoln vetoes it and never signs it. So that means of the two plans that were put forth on what to do after Reconstruction, zero plans pass. And when Lincoln is killed on April or in April of 1865, there's no plan whatsoever on what to do when the war is over. Government also has to plan for emancipation. And that really starts January 1st, 1863 with the release of the Emancipation Proclamation. The government and the union is forced to recognize that the war is no longer about preserving the union. The war is about ending slavery. So the, in true fashion and form, the government comes up with no plan on what to do with emancipation. They don't know who's going to be in charge of it. They don't know who's going to pay for it. Um, it could be the army, it could be the treasury, it could be missionary societies, it could be private businessmen. All of those personnel and all those entities were involved and asked to do something. Well, the three main groups, the U.S. Army, they're only equipped to help for a short amount of time because, well, quite frankly, it's not their job to take care of all the former slaves. They're there to wage war and take over territory. The U.S. Army, basically what they would do is they would give you a hot meal, they would give you maybe a cot to sleep on, and they would continue on their way. The U.S. Treasury agents, uh, because they're dealing with money, they wanted to get the former slaves back to work as quickly as possible. And then you have the private businessmen who are looking for ways to make profit. They're trying to get land from the former Southern slave owners. They're trying to find employees to work on the land. Well, the former slaves are going to become their labor source. Now, even from the point of the slaves or soon to be former slaves, they have no plan either because they have to decide what are we going to do when we're no longer slaves? Are we going to stay on the land we're living on? Are we going to move to a city? Are we going to move to a country? Are we going to stay in the north? Are we going to stay in the south? How are we going to find our families? Because remember, families were often torn apart. 
Well, for former slaves, most of the help came from a, an organization, part of the government, known as the Freedmen's Bureau. The Freedmen's Bureau's long title is the Bureau of Refugees, Freedmen, and Abandoned Lands. Now, the Freedmen's Bureau's job is to provide some medical care, some education, some help with contracts, some help with food, clothes, and shelter. What the Freedmen's Bureau couldn't do, Northern Missionary Societies came in and completed. Uh, the Northern Missionary Societies, their primary job was to set up black churches to provide a place where these former slaves could create their own community space and their own place to worship and eventually develop their own community leaders. When the former slaves are freed, uh, the jobs that they're forced to take look very similar to the jobs they did while they were slaves. If they were field workers when they were slaves, they're going to be field workers when they're free. If they were domestic servants when they were field workers, well, they're going to be domestic servants when they're free. And as the war ends, southern governments, even though you know there's a question on how they're going to become part of the Union again, there are still Southern governments or representatives in Southern governments who are doing the work. And in many of these Southern governments, as an attempt to control African Americans, they make it illegal to be homeless and they make it illegal to be unemployed. This forced labor is known as black codes. Now, black codes are not the same as Jim Crow. Jim Crow laws are much more famous and much more well known, but Jim Crow and black codes are not the same. These black codes happen right after the Civil War. Jim Crow is going to be kind of the late 1870s going into the 1880s. So just make sure you know that there is a difference. With black codes, it became illegal to be unemployed. It became illegal to be homeless. If you were arrested, you were thrown in jail. To get out of jail, you had to pay a fine. And these people didn't have money to pay the fine, so very often former slave owners came, paid the fine, broke them out of jail, and then the former slave is back in a form of bondage because they have to pay off the debts that they just incurred. Um, it also became illegal to own or rent your land in some cases. It became illegal to gather in numbers, break a contract, or even insult a person who was white. This guy. This guy is interesting. It's President Andrew Johnson. Andrew Johnson is a Southern Democrat from Tennessee. He is going to become Abraham Lincoln's vice president for Abraham Lincoln's second term. Now, if you're wondering why Lincoln chose Johnson to be his running mate, it's because Lincoln was part of this unity campaign, and he wanted to try and end the war quicker by showing that the North and South could get along. Well, when Lincoln is killed by John Wilkes Booth in April of 1865, it was never thought that Johnson would become president. And now you have this Southern Democrat from Tennessee who's finishing up the Civil War and also having to decide how to reconstruct the South. And he comes up with a plan where um, property would be given back to the Southerners other than slaves. Um, the governments would be reconstituted and everything would be fine. Basically, um, Andrew Johnson wanted to give the South a slap on the wrist. Don't do that again. Go to your room and we'll get on with it. When it came time to put the Freedmen's Bureau into law, Andrew Johnson vetoed it. When there was an attempt at a civil rights bill in Congress, Andrew Johnson vetoed it. And Congress disagreed with Andrew Johnson to the point that Andrew Johnson was accused of treason, basically, and impeached. 
Andrew Johnson, he goes to trial for high crimes and misdemeanors, and he is able to maintain his presidency by one single vote. If one more person had voted to make that Johnson was guilty, Johnson would have been removed as president. When Johnson is put on trial, he's basically told to be quiet and Congress is going to take over the Act of Reconstruction. With the Reconstruction Act of 1867, most of the South is put under a military control. 20,000 troops are stationed throughout the South. Five different military districts are created. The Reconstruction Act of 1867 and these military districts required new states to be uh, or new state constitutions to be written, required black suffrage, the right to vote for African Americans to be guaranteed in these constitutions, and these southern states had to agree to sign the 13th Amendment. Well, I'll get to the 13th Amendment in just a moment. These radical reconstructionists also refinanced the, Freedman, the Freedmen's Bureau, giving it more money and disqualified or disenfranchised is the fancy term about 700,000 white democrats from the south this allowed the republican party to get a foothold in the south not because the southerners liked what the republicans were doing at the time but simply because there weren't enough southern white voters to overcome the number of republicans who had moved south now, just real quick, I want you to know that the Republicans have not been in charge of the South since 1865. While it is true most of the higher offices in the South are now held by Republicans, this Republican domination really started around the year 2000, maybe 2004. Almost exclusively, from about 1875 up until 2004, the South was almost 100% held by de the Democratic Party. There were a lot of groups who were against the idea of Reconstruction. There were political attacks. Uh, there were politicians speaking out against it. There were wealthy people in the South speaking out against it. But then there were violent attacks. There's the red shirts who wanted to get rid of the Republican Party in the South. And more famously, there is the KKK. It's a violent fraternity of Southern whites and they had really equal opportunity hate. Their hate was geared towards black voters, white Republicans, union members, uh, Jewish people, Freedmen's Bureau agents, you name it, they were targeted. The federal government responds by issuing the KKK Act and the Enforcement Acts. Um, they made the, the KKK illegal. These laws allowed the federal government to arrest KKK members and put them on trial. And these two acts allowed for elections in the South to be supervised. Now, the KKK is going to pretty much disappear by 1873. And that's not because of these enforcement acts. It's really because by 1873, Democratic Party members have by and large regained control of the South. And um, those who are hardline Confederate or former Confederate leaders or believers don't see the need for the KKK to exist anymore. Now you also might say, wait a minute, the KKK does exist today. Well, there have actually been three different iterations or three different versions of the KKK and we are currently on the third evolution of it. Last but not least, there are three reconstruction amendments you should know. The 13th Amendment December 6, 1865, 
that is the constitutional amendment that officially outlawed slavery. The 14th Amendment, July 9th, 1868, that is what formally reversed the Dred Scott case and gave African Americans or uh, black citizens the right to American citizenship. And then finally, the 15th Amendment, February 26, 1869, that is the amendment that extended the right to vote to uh, black males. Um, women will not get to vote until 1920. Af um, Native Americans, they're not even going to be considered for citizenship until the 19 teens. So really, after February 26, 1869, all males and males only who are white and or black can vote, but that's not actually true because there are going to be some things called poll taxes, literacy tests, and all these other things that are going to be used to keep African Americans from voting throughout the South. Um, but that is your down and dirty look at the, the um, Reconstruction. Reconstruction ends in um, basically 1876 when Rutherford B. Hayes is elected president. In exchange for Southern votes, uh, Rutherford B. Hayes agrees to end Reconstruction. And when Rutherford B. Hayes becomes president, one of the first things he does, if not the first thing he does, is signal that Reconstruction has ended. And unfortunately for those people living in the South, Reconstruction is only really half done. It's never completed. And that leads to a lot of racial tension and a lot of racial inequality that goes on throughout the early 20th century all the way up to the um, civil rights movement that you would talk about in U.S. history too. All right, uh, I just want to say thank you for watching. Thank you for your time. Um, if you email me, and tell me that you watched this video, I will give you five extra points on your final exam as a thank you. Also, if you have any suggestions on what I can do to improve this course and make it more interesting or better, uh, feel free to email me because I do value your feedback and I very often take that feedback and put it into action to make the class better for those who come after you. All right, that is it. Thank you again. I hope you do well on your final exams. I hope you get the grades you're looking for, and it has been a pleasure to be your teacher for this semester. I hope to see some of you in person one day, or maybe in another class of mine. I'll talk to you again eventually. Thank you. Bye-bye.